Isn't that a wonderful title, as Brother Eddie has said, The Lamb of God? Um, we pray, God, we never get over that title. That just says it all. Turn, if you would, in your Bibles to Esther as we continue our study. It's been a little while, but I'm sure that you all remember everything I said word by word. <laughs> so if you turn, please, in your Bible to Esther chapter 2 as we continue to study this portion of God's wonderful word. Let's first of all pray. Father, we come to you this morning and we ha ask you to help us, Lord, to be a godly people. Lord, we, 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 we know you've left us in the world, not that we should become like the world, but that we should be godly and separate from the world. Help us this morning to devalue this world that we live in and to value you, Lord. Help us to work towards the goal that we might hear you say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, turn in, uh, as I mentioned, to uh, Esther here, chapter 2, and we'll uh, read some verses here, just to refresh your memory, and also as we cover new uh, items this morning. After these things, when the wrath of King Ahasuerus was appeased, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what was decreed against her. Then said the king's servants that ministered unto him, Let there be fair young virgins, virgins sought for the king, and let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom, that they may gather together all the fair young virgins unto Shushan the palace, to the house of the women, unto the custody of Hegi, the King's Chamberlain, keeper of the women, and let their things for purification be given them. And let the maiden which pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. And the thing pleased the king, and he did so. Now in Shushan the palace there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite, who had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captivity which they, which they had been carried away with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. And he brought up Hadassah, that is, Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother, and the maid was fair and beautiful, whom Mordecai, when her father and mother were dead, took for his own daughter. So it came to pass, when the king's commandment and his decree was heard, that many maidens were gathered together under Shushan the palace, to the custody of Haggai, the Esther was brought also unto the king's house, to the custody of Haggai, keeper of the women. And the maiden pleased him, and she obtained kindness of him, and he speedily gave her her things for purification with things as belonged to her, and seven maidens, which were meet to be given her out of the king's house, and he preferred her and her maidens unto the best place of the house of the women." Esther had not shown her people nor her kindred, for Mordecai had charged her that she should not show it. And Mordecai walked every day before the court of the women's house to know how Esther did and what should become of her. And when every maid's turn was come in to go to the king Ahasuerus, after she had been 12 months, according to the manner of women, for so were the days of her purifications accomplished, to wit six months with oil of myrrh, six months with sweet odors, and other things for the purifying of the women, then thus came every maiden unto the king, whose whatsoever she desired was given her to go with her out of the king's, out of the house of the women unto the king's house. In the evening she went, on the morning she returned unto the second house of the women to the custody of Shazgaz, the king's chamberlain, which kept the concubines. They, she came in unto the king no more, except the king delighted in her, and that she were called by name. And when the turn of Esther, the daughter of Abigail, Abihail, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her for his daughter, was come to go into the king. She required nothing but what Haggai, the king's chamberlain, the keeper of the women, appointed. And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all them that looked upon her. So Esther was taken unto King Ahasuerus into his house royal in the tenth month, which is the month Tebeth, in the seventh month of his reign. And the king loved Esther above all the women. And she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown upon her head and her queen instead of Vashti. Now, you remember how our history, though, so, so forth, as we've been studying this book, is really a history of the saving of the people of God. This, this book of Esther is another one of these great 
histories in the Bible of God saving his people, his Jewish people. And, a, and we have been taken, as this, as this book starts off, right into the center of a heathen palace called Shushan. And right into the center, really learning more than we ever really wanted to know about a king called Ahasuerus and all of his pride and all of his self-arrogance and his six months banquet which centered on himself and his own greatness. We saw all that spirit that God hates of pride and arrogance and we saw as a result of it how he lost his wife Vashti because she refused to submit to his, his lewd request. And we saw how the king's couriers who were just standing there waiting on him, wanting to make the king happy, proposed this nationwide hunt for the most beautiful women. And the king agreed with the proposal. Now, then we saw that our attention was then brought down in chapter 2, as we've read already, to a man who is called a certain Jew a certain individual, a certain person named Mordecai. And, our, and we've been drawn in to read about this person, a heartbreaking description of a man. In verse 6, it describes him as someone who had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captivity which had been carried away with Jeconiah king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon had carried away. So the description for our hero in this, in this account is a man who is described as carried away. He's a prisoner. He's a captive person. And then it says that he wasn't just carried away from any place. He was carried away from the capital of the Jewish people, the cap, God's capital, Jerusalem, their capital. And he was carried away with a group which is described as the captivity, prisoners of war. Color those people the prisoners of war. And what made it even worse is that he saw the king, their king, King Jeconiah, king of Judah, he watched their king also be carried away in shackles as a prisoner of war. Now, it would have been very, very easy for our man, Mordecai, just to, just to give up and just to say, I'm so discouraged. I, I, he, he could have very easily had just said, what's the use? What's the use in living for God? What's the use in trying to obey God? He had just watched his own people turn away from God into idolatry. He saw that, and he knew very, very well why they were conquered, why they were in captivity in Babylon. He knew all that. He knew it was for judgment. And so, But Mordecai is a different kind of a man. He's a good man, Mordecai. He's a man who didn't go along with the majority of the idolatry and the sin of the Jewish people. He remained faithful to the God of Israel. That's Mordecai. And there's a certain beauty that we look at when we look at Mordecai and we say, that's beautiful. Because when we see him in the middle of a heathen environment, coming from a people who have turned away from God, and yet we see him there faithful, faithful. He's, a, he's someone as a pattern for us. We say, oh, that we should remain true to the Lord Jesus Christ in this present world. In this present world, as we mentioned a couple weeks ago, we live in a country right now with unprecedented, where our president has stood up in favor of homosexual marriages. Now, God is against homosexual marriages, so our president has taken a stand against God. And we live in this kind of environment. And that's, we're like Mordecai in that sense. So when we see in Mordecai a man who has decided, I'm going to stay true to God, no matter what my environment does, no matter the direction the world goes in, you know what it does for us? It says to us, oh, if he can do it, I can do it too. We can be just like Mordecai. Now, Mordecai is actually part of what God describes. And if, if you like, please to turn to Isaiah chapter 1, because there's a description of this type of person or uh, the, down through the ages. In Isaiah chapter 1, verse 9, God calls these people, he calls them, 
his remnant. See, Isaiah 1.9, except the Lord of hosts. Now this is kind of interesting because here we have in this passage here in Isaiah 1, we, we, we start off and we hear God speaking and, and he's uh, accusing his people and he's saying, you know, why will you be stricken anymore and your whole head in verse 6 is sick and your heart is faint and everything's wrong with you. He, God is essentially saying, from the sole of the foot even to the head, there is no soundness in it. He goes on and, and he says this in, in verses 5 and 6. And, and then it, it seems like uh, all of a sudden there's a switch and in verse 9, it seems as though Israel, who he's been describing, speaks. And we don't know who's speaking, but this person within Israel says, you know what, unless the Lord of hosts, the great God of the universe, the God of creation, unless the Lord of hosts had left to us, and notice those words, a very small remnant. He could have said a remnant, but he didn't. He could have said a small remnant, but he didn't. Instead, he said a very small remnant. You know why he said that? Because it's very small. <laughs> and it's a remnant. He says a very small remnant. He said unless God had left us a very, very infinitesimal small remnant, we should have been like Sodom and Gomorrah. We should have been like Sodom and Gomorrah. We should have, what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? They were destroyed. Why were Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed? Was it because they, 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 were, they, they were sinful and they, they had, uh, had homosexuality as a standard way of life? Is that why they were destroyed? Well, when you read in Genesis, actually the reason that they were destroyed, well, yes, that was true, but the question is why weren't they preserved? They weren't preserved because there wasn't enough of this very small remnant. There wasn't enough of the, of the righteous in those city. You remember when Abraham got in front of God and, and bargained with God and said, now Lord, uh, what about if there's 50 righteous in the city? You wouldn't destroy the, the Sodom and Gomorrah if there are 50 righteous, would you? No. Okay. And he says, all right, we got 50. So he's going to have 45. Okay, we got 45, 40. He keeps on going down, 30, 35. And he, and he says, now I just have one more, one more. And God held him to it. But anyways, he said, if there's just 10, we, he says, no, I won't destroy it in 10. There were not 10 left in Sodom and Gomorrah. Therefore, the city was destroyed. That's what's being referred to here by the people of Israel when they said, unless the Lord had left us the very small amount, we would have been wiped out like Sodom and Gomorrah. Mordecai was one of that very small remnant. He was not going, color Mordecai not going along with the crowd. He was not part of the majority. He stood true to God. He stood faithful to God. This was a wonderful man, Mordecai. He literally, like the remnant, preserved the nation of Israel. He really did preserve the nation of Israel because of him, uh, the nation of Israel was saved. Today, the majority of the Jewish people have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. They've rejected him as their God. They rejected him. I was just with the Jewish rabbi this last week. We spent a couple days together and his wife. <clears throat> and the arguments again were like, they, they, they said, they said, they said, they, they said, well, think of all the people who died in the gas chambers and who died in the Holocaust. They can't all be wrong. We can't go along with you because they didn't go along with you. See the majority, the argument from the majority. Uh, you know, I asked him, I said, please don't hang the Holocaust around people's necks. But <clears throat> anyway, that's what was going on there is that there was there, the, today is that it's, again, a very small remnant of the Jewish people who are following the Lord Jesus Christ. And so like with, with Mordecai was. Now, this is a very sad description of Mordecai. Verse 7 now, we have another very sad description. This is a description of a girl named Hadassah, means the myrtle tree. It says, up in, it says here in verse 7, he brought up Hadassah. That's Esther. She's also Esther. This is, this is his uncle's daughter, makes her his cousin. For she didn't have a mother, and she didn't have a father, and the maid was fair and beautiful. And, the, and Mordecai, when her father and mother were dead, he took her for his own daughter. So here's a young girl. A young girl who's the daughter of, of Mordecai's 
uh, brother. She's an orphan, and he feels so sorry for her. He takes her in and he raises her. And it's, it's emphasized that he takes her as his own daughter, as his own daughter. He never made her feel like she was an orphan or that she wasn't really a part of the family. He took her in and he raised her as his own daughter. He was a faithful father to Esther. Mordecai was a faithful father to Esther. We don't know if Mordecai had other children. Maybe he did, but, but, but if he didn't, if he did or if he didn't, we can sort of imagine what would this godly father Mordecai have done in his home with Esther, with his other children too. And turn, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 2, verse 10, and just imagine a conversation within the home of of. Um, of Mordecai as he gathers his children around him and he teaches them from the word of God. And he says to them, and maybe there's some girls and maybe there's some boys, some sons and some daughters in the group there. And he gathers his little, his, his kids around him and he reads to them the words of Solomon, king of Israel. And he starts at verse 10 and he says, when he says, he says kids, when wisdom go, enters inside your heart and knowledge is pleasant to your soul, not a duty, but it really gets in you to the point where you love the truth of God. Then you know what's going to happen, he says in verse 11, discretion is going to preserve you. It's going to keep you. Understanding is going to keep you. And then he turns to the girls, to the daughters, to Esther also, because she was fair and beautiful also. And he said, Esther, is my daughter, he says, you are going to need to be delivered from the way of evil men. There are evil men out there, and these are men who speak forward things. These are men who will want to impress you and to seduce you and to lure you away. And look, my daughter, Esther, verse 13, they are leaving the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness. They are going to lead you into the way of darkness. They're so happy, they rejoice to do evil evil and delight in the forwardness of the wicked. Uh, the, the school I used to go to, Miami University, it was well known how a lot of the guys in the dorms used to take the Chiquita banana peels and put them on the side of their bed for how many women they defiled. This is, so he would describe this in uh, verse 15. He says, their ways are crooked. They are forward in their paths. And then he would turn to his sons and he would say, now to you, my sons, he says, he says, he says, the word of God will deliver you from strange women. Even from the stranger who flatters with her words, who tells you how nice you look and how great you are. Which fors- and they forsake the guide of their youth, he says, and forget the covenant of her God. For her house inclineth unto death and her paths unto the dead. None that go unto her return again. Neither take they hold of the paths of life. It's not about pleasure. It's about whether it's about life and death, he would explain to them. And he would teach them. And he would say to both of them, oh, that you might walk in the ways of good and keep the paths of the righteous because the upright is going to dwell in the land. What land? The land of God. And I shall live in the house of the Lord forever. And the perfect shall remain in it but the wicked shall be cut off from the earth and the transgressor shall be rooted out of it. So he taught them and he showed them from the word of God how they were to live their lives and keep themselves clean and pure in the midst of a defiling world. And they were. And, and I want you to keep in mind that as he's sitting there teaching his, his little flock and Esther's a part of that, you know, we know because we've read the rest here what's going to happen to her as she grows up and as she's teaching them. But that little family was faithful to God because Mordecai took time to not only teach from the book of Proverbs, but he taught them from the history of his people. He taught them from the history of the Jewish people, which he had the records of. And he taught them about the greatness of his people. He taught them about the greatness of the Jewish people. And he said the greatness of the Jewish people is not in the Jewish people. He didn't teach them about the Albert Einsteins and the Leonard Bernsteins and the Mark Zuckermans of the Jewish people. He didn't didn't teach them them because he said, I'll tell you who the, the great Jewish people were. They were the ones who lost the world and gained their own souls. 
not the ones who gained their souls, gained the world and lost their souls. And so he taught them about the greatness of the Jewish people named Abraham and the greatness of the Jewish people of, named Moses who forsook Egypt and, and said, God's better, and the greatness of Joshua and the greatness of Gideon and the greatness of David. And he says, because all of this he taught them, and he says, you know what all these people said? All these people said, Psalm 115, 1. Here they all said, not unto us, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory. He said, that's the greatness of the people, the ones that bring glory to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Even though he didn't know him by that name, but that's what he was doing. So he taught his family this. And he taught little Esther. And he said, he said as he gathered them around, he said, i got to tell you something. It happened in the life of our people. And he took them to Genesis 12. Turn to Genesis 12 as he, <clears throat> as he was teaching them. In Genesis 12, one of the great, great histories here as he encouraged them because they were in the midst of a very wicked place in Shushan the palace. And he taught them, he said, this is not the first time our people have been in the midst of a very wicked place, but I'm going to teach you through this, this, this history here. And look what he said in, verse 12, in Genesis 12, verse 10. And it says here, And there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. And it came to pass, when he was come near to enter into Egypt, that he said unto Sarah his wife, Behold, now I know that thou art a fair woman, to look upon. I don't know what was wrong with Abraham. With with I don't know why he just now decided that she was pretty, but for some reason, I don't know, maybe someone else looked at her, but anyway, for some reason he came to this conclusion. Therefore it shall come to pass when the Egyptians shall say thee that thou, they shall say, this is his wife and they'll kill me and they'll save thee alive. So Abraham, there was no question about it. Anyway, so uh, verse 13, Say, I pray thee that thou art my sister, that it may be well with me for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. And so he explained this to them, and he told them, he said, you know, he said, he said our father, our patriarch Abraham, he was afraid. And he, 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 he was wrong, and he made an error. And what was his error? Because he thought that the king of the e Egypt here, Pharaoh, he thought he was greater than God. But he's not greater than God. God is greater than Pharaoh. But this has been written for us so that we can understand, so that we can, we can learn from this. He told little Esther. And so then she, she, she's reading this and, uh, along with him. And so... <clears throat> It would happen. And so then it says in, in verse 14, it came to pass that when Abraham was coming to Egypt, the Egyptians beheld the woman, that she was very fair, so they thought she was pretty too. The princess also of Pharaoh saw her and commended her before Pharaoh, and the women, woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And at that point, maybe, maybe Mordecai said, oh no, she was taken into Pharaoh's house. How could God have let that happen? What's going on? Where's God? Maybe the little kid said, where's God? Where's God? Well, let's keep reading. And verse 16, and he entreated Abraham well for her sake, and he had sheep and oxen and asses and men servants, maid servants and she asses and camels. So, so our people got a lot of money for her. So <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but, but <laughs> she's thinking, is that fair? But she says, keep reading. Verse 17, and the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abraham's wife. God took care of her. And, Abra and Pharaoh called Abraham and said, What is this that thou hast done unto me? Why dost not tell me she was thy wife? Why saidst thou she is my sister, so I may have taken her to me to wife? Now therefore, behold thy wife, take her and go thy way. And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away, and his wife, and, 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 and all that he had. And so he told her, he said, look, look what happened. He said, she said, you know, she, she, she was obedient because she knew she wasn't his, his sister. But Abraham said to her, you say, you are my sister. And she, and he told her, said, and she could have said, I'm not going to do that because it's not true. You're not, my, you're my husband. But he said, you say this. And she said, okay. And that's also commended in the book of Peter. It says, you know, uh, she called him Lord. But he said, okay. And so God honored her obedience. Do you see that, Esther? God honored her obedience. And God took care of her. And Pharaoh never touched her. And they got great riches. And they needed those riches as they came, later came through. So God overruled it all. Why? Because God is greater than Pharaoh. 
And God, our God, is to be trusted above Pharaoh. And so this was a bad decision on, on Abraham's part. And he says, and, he, and then he would say now, and then, and then he would gather his kids together. And now he says, now kids, now let's, let's look at, at Genesis 20 just to see how well it, uh, our father Abraham learned the lesson. And so <clears throat> come now to, to tw chapter 20 and verse 1. And here it's, it's not fair. It's not Pharaoh. It's a different situation. And he says in, in verse 20, verse 1, And Abraham journeyed from thence toward the south country and dwelt between Kadesh and Shur, and sojourned in Gerar. And Abraham said of Sarah his wife, She's my sister. And Abimelech king of Gerar sent and took Sarah. I'm sure Sarah said, Not this again. Anyway, so then she said, but that's what happened. In verse 3, But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man. And I'm sure that Mordecai put down, his, put down his scroll at that point and said, do you see what God did? Even though he stumbled a second time, our father Abraham. And Sarah obeyed him. Sarah was good. She obeyed. Even though he did that a second time, do you see what God did? He didn't have to do this, but he came in a dream to, to, to Abimelech. And he said to Abimelech, you're as good as dead. You're dead. And he, said, he read, and, and, he, and he said that, Behold, thou art but a dead man, for the woman which thou hast taken, she is a man's wife. But Abimelech had not come near her. And he said, Lord, wilt thou slay also a righteous nation? Said they not unto me, she is my sister, and she even she herself said, He's my brother, in the integrity of my heart, and in of my hands have I done this. And God said unto him in a dream, Yea, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart, for I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. Now therefore restore the man his wife, for he is a prophet. He'll pray for thee, and thou shalt live. And, and if thou restore her not, know that, know that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are thine. Therefore Abimelech rose up early in the morning. <laughs> That's an important word. <laughs> And called all his servants and told all these things in their ears. And the men were sore affrighted. It says, <clears throat> Then Abimelech called Abraham and, and said unto him, What hast thou done unto us? And what have I offended? And what has brought on me on my kingdom a great sin that thou hast done deeds unto me that ought not to be done? And Abimelech said unto Abraham, What sawest thou that thou didst not this thing? And Abraham said, Because I thought surely the fear of God is not in this place. And they'll slay me for my wife's sake. And then, they'll, and then Mordecai would have turned to, to, to Esther and said, it doesn't matter if the fear of God is not in this place because God is still over this place. And he was still over there. And Abraham was wrong because he was wrong thinking. Because he thought, well, I have to be in a place where they respect God. And he says, no, you don't. You have, to be in a, you have to be in the place where you obey God, where you walk with God, where you obey. And you see, Esther, how God honored her obedience you see that, Esther? In all of this, he was building in her this, 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 this need to be obedient. And he was building in her about, about the great God of Abraham that took care of Abraham even when he stumbled the two times. And she was getting it. She was getting it more and more as, as, they, as they went along. And, and, and this passage goes on and he says, look, he says, uh, he says, uh, he says uh, uh, Abimelech sent him away and gave him a lot of things. It says there in verse 14, Abimelech took sheep and oxen, men servants, men, women servants, gave them to Abraham, restored Sarah his wife. Abimelech said, Behold, my land is before thee, dwell where it pleaseth thee. Unto Sarah he said, Behold, I have given thy brother a thousand pieces of silver. And then, he said, then she took, she says, Look what the beautiful thing that the king Abimelech said to about Abraham and to Sarah. He said to her, he said, well, well, he says, he says, well, Uncle Mordecai, does this mean that, 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 that she should have many men in her life? He says, no, no, no. He says, look what she said. She says, he is to be to you a covering of the eyes. Abraham, Sarah, he said to Sarah, he said, Sarah, Abraham is to you a covering of the eyes. That's all you see. You just see him, Sarah, in your life. He says, isn't that beautiful? And she got it, and she understood it. And she, all these things were percolating in her head because she was understanding more and more as, 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 as Mordecai was taking time to teach her, God was greater than Pharaoh. God was greater than King Abimelech. God is greater than King Ahasuerus in which we live in. And what's the message for us? God is greater than any president or ruler on this earth. God is greater. And this is what was coming through. And so, and then he, the other thing he said is that if you obey, if you obey like Sarah obeyed, God will be so pleased with you, he'll work it all out. 
He'll make it all come to good. And He'll even use you. Maybe, maybe He'll use you. Little Esther, you are beautiful. Your matriarch, Sarah, was beautiful. Her beauty got her in trouble. Your beauty will get you. No, I don't know if you said that. But, <laughs> but anyways, but he, he, said, he said, but even, she, she said, the beauty that Sarah had was not, look how beautiful I am. The beauty that Sarah had was that, don't look at my, my outward appearance. Look at how I submit myself to Abraham. Look at how I call him Lord. Look at how I even say, yeah, he's my brother, because he told me to say that. That's beautiful, he would say. That's what God says. Oh, that's so beautiful. And then little, little, little Esther would say, thank you, good night, uncle. And she would say, he would say, good night, Esther. And these things percolated in her mind, and they went down. And what was he doing? What was Mordecai doing with all of this? Mordecai was building a foundation in her. And little did Mordecai know how that foundation was going to be used by God. Little did he know that Proverbs 22.6 was going to play out in his hands. Train up a child, train up, little, train up little Esther in the way that she should go. And when she is old and outside of the home, she won't depart. She'll continue right on down the road, the course that you set for her. You know, last Friday, we went to our, the graduation of our granddaughter from kindergarten. That was a more festive event than me getting my bachelor's degree from the University of California, San Diego. <laughs> it took a long time. There were six kids in the class at a Christian school. And in the ceremony, it was beautiful to see because these six little kids, they pledged allegiance to the Christian flag and then they pledged allegiance to the Bible and they pledged allegiance to the Savior and they recited the Lord's Prayer and they recited the 23rd Psalm and they recited many verses from Psalm 119 and our little granddaughter Grace worked so hard and she held the Bible up there and led them all in the Pledge of the Bible and it was so great to see, why? Seeds had obviously been planted within these kids. A foundation had been laid in the school within these kids. And they were showing that, that these things were deep within their hearts. And you could see it on the face of the kids. Uh, this uh, June 21st, we're gonna have, we have a kindergarten also down in Mexico. We're going to have a graduation there of eight kids. And same thing. They're going to have, it's going to be almost an all-day event. And they're also going to stand up and, and uh, pray and read from Scripture and recite verses they've memorized and things like this. And you look at that and you say to yourself, oh, I'm so glad. Because what we're seeing here in the schools and so forth in the homes is just the continuation of what Mordecai was doing. Just the same thing, building and building, planting little seeds, little seeds through the story, not the stories, through the histories of the parting of the Red Sea, of the, of the, tw of the plagues, the deliverance from Egypt, and all of, these, all of these histories to basically say no one's greater than our God. No one's greater than our God. No one's greater than the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And if I obey God in my life, God can use me. That's the foundation that was built within her heart. God can use Do you have kids? Do you have grandkids? Do you volunteer in Sunday school? My friend, Dr. Zolt, who has the um, Boys and Girls Club of uh, El Cajon, he's looking for volunteers. You have an opportunity to do this. You have an opportunity to build within the life of kids, to build this. Just kids need to see adults speak seriously about God. Speak, speak, with, speak with, from a heart of reliance on God. Show by their own way that they talk about the Bible and that they talk about God that this is a book to follow through life. This is a God to trust. This is a God to love and worship. This is a God to follow. This is a God not to forsake. That's us. And when we do that, same thing like in Mordecai, we plant deep, deep, deep into the hearts of the kids. And that's wonderful to do. Now, verse 8, so it came to pass when the king's commandment and his degree was heard that many, many mains were gathered together into Shushan the palace to the custody of Haggai, that Esther was brought also into the king's house to the custody of Haggai, keeper of the women. Now comes the horror of it all. Young girls gathered up, not even asked, 
simply on the basis of their appearance, rounded up, no consent, no request. You're just, you're, and going through the cut, the first cut, Esther's taken. And meanwhile, now Esther is out of Mordecai's sight and out of her care, his care. And she obtains favor from, uh, from, the, from Haggai in verse 9, as we've seen. But what was Esther doing and what was she thinking during all this time, this particular time? Verse 10 gives us a clue. Esther had not showed her people nor her kindred. Why? For Mordecai had charged her that she should not show it. And so Esther was sitting there and she was saying to herself, I remember when I sat in front of Uncle Mordecai. I remember when, she, when he taught me that Abraham told Sarah, you say, I'm your brother. I remember how Sarah obeyed. I remember how God honored that. And Mordecai told me, do not show that I am a Jew. Do not show my kindred. And so keep this name, this foreign name, Esther. Do never say the name Hadassah. And she did. And she did that because she it says here in verse 10, because, she, because he charged her, you do this. And she was obedient. I remember all those things, she said. And she said, and, she, and so now, what was Mordecai doing? What was he thinking? Well, verse 11 says he was pretty nervous. And he was walking every day in front of the court of the women. He was a nervous wreck. And he was, he was going crazy, worried, what's happening to my daughter? My little Esther, what's happening? What's becoming? Is she safe? You know, concubines who were chosen and, and, and uh, uh, gathered up here and went in for the one night with the king. They had a very unhappy life after that, and a life of solitude. They weren't allowed to go out. They weren't allowed, couldn't get married. They just had to remain in solitude for the rest of their lives. So it was, they were really, it was very, not a good existence. So now it comes down to, well, Mr. Mordecai, well, Mr. Bible teacher, time for you. Time for you to take the medicine. Time for you to take the, the Bible lessons for your own heart. So Mordecai goes back to the Bible himself. And he goes back to the history of his people. And this time he doesn't go back to Abraham. This time he goes back to Moses. And we can imagine him reading. Turn to Exodus chapter 2. Exodus chapter 2. Exodus chapter 2. And here's Mordecai and he's all alone there at home. And he's just beside himself, worried sick for what's going to happen. And he reads this scroll in Exodus chapter 2, verse 1. It says, There went out a man of the house of Levi, took to wife, a daughter of Levi. She, the woman conceived, bare a son. When she saw him, that he was a godly child, she hid him three months. And when she could not longer hide him, she took him an uh, ark of bulrushes and daubed it. Notice that she did it. She built the ark. Daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein. Notice that. She put the child in it. And she laid it in the flags by the river's bank. Notice that. She put the ark in the water. And so forth. <clears throat> and he sat there and he says to himself as he reads this, he says, it's my turn. My turn to trust God. This woman's name is Jochebed, the mother of Joseph, uh, Moses. He says, my turn to be like Jochebed. To be strong like Jochebed. Mordecai would have seen how Jochebed's child, Moses, was born in a very unfortunate time of history. It's actually, there was, he was under an edict for male child extermination. And, and, and just as Esther was born and was there in a very unfortunate time of history, because she happened to be beautiful, and Vashti was kicked out, and she got taken up and, anyway, and she was also an orphan. So he would have thought, you know, Jochebed could only keep her child for a certain period of time. It says three months, just temporarily. Then she had to give him up. And the people from the king's palace came and took Esther, and I had to give her up. I didn't want to, but Jochebed didn't want to, but we're both in the same boat. No play on words. Anyways, we're both in the same situation right now, and we had to give up the one we loved, our children. And then Mordecai would have thought of Jochebed making that little ark. And he would have thought, oh, the heartbrokenness of it all. She's making an ark for her child that she knows she's going to put into, a, uh, into the Nile River. And, and, and then she's, and she's, and it says here, as, it says, as we read, she's putting the tar on the ark. It's, it's, she's not it's just a building, but she's describing how she's putting the tar. You think that tar wasn't wet with her tears? 
as she knew what she was doing. She was building that little ark there. And then she comes down to the edge of the river, a crocodile infested river, the Nile River, where little Moses would have been less than an appetizer for one of those crocodiles. And with strong currents that in a moment little Moses would have been drowned. And with all the anxiety in her mind and the currents of, 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 of worry and the idea of the thought of her floating her baby down this river and Mordecai then pacing back and forth and then Mordecai would have thought to himself, you know, Jochebed realized God was greater than the Nile River. God was greater than Pharaoh. God was greater than anybody there and God took care of her little baby. And so as she, as she, as, as Jochebed, he pictured her as Jochebed taking little Moses, again, her warm tears splashing off of his little face, not knowing what's going on. And as he puts, as, as she puts her baby in this ark and then takes the ark and walks over to the edge of the building and sets it down there. And he's sitting there thinking to himself as he's pacing back and forth in front of the palace, how did she do it? How did she do it? How did she do it? And then he realized, he realized, he said, I know how she did it because she didn't see the ark anymore. And she didn't see the, the Nile anymore. What she saw? The arms and the hands of God. And so she said, she said, oh God, some people may call this an ark. Maybe some people call this a river. But you know what I call those? I call those the hands of God and the arms of God. And I'm taking this baby now and I'm placing my baby into your hands and into your arms. And you'll take care of him. And little did she know, that that baby, who she did that to, would write those very words to his own people in Deuteronomy 33, 27, when he would say, the eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. And from that thought, he could gain strength and encouragement to trust his daughter, Esther, into the hands there of what was going on. And you know what happened to him? The shalom of God. The peace of God came and set up a garrison in his heart. Philippians 4, 7. And the peace of God, the shalom of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep or guard or garrison your hearts and minds from running crazy through Christ Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? These are our two people. These are our heroes. These are the ones that God is going to use to save this nation. That's an amazing thing. Now, why would God choose them, the Mordecai and Esther? 1 Corinthians 1, 26 to 29 tells us, you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, no, my, not many mighty, not many noble are called. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty, base things of the world, things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things that are not, to bring to naught the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. What could be less noble? What could be less mighty? What could be more foolish and more base and more near to nothing than a prisoner of war and the orphan of dead prisoners of war? Through, but that's Mordecai and Esther. But through these two, God is going to save his people. God is going to save the line through which God himself will come as the Messiah and will bring salvation to the world by becoming, as we heard this morning, the Lamb of God. Why did he do that? Why did he choose them? Because when he chose Esther and Mordecai, he confounded the wise. He confused the mighty. He reduced to nothing the things that really seemed great. Why? So no flesh can glory in his presence. And that everybody can learn, as Mordecai taught Esther, there's only one great. That's God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And for us, it's ours just to worship him, to praise him, and to know that every knee is going to bow before him, and every tongue is going to say the truth that he is Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the encouraging histories that you give us here, Lord, in the book of Esther and how you saved your people. Thank you for the faithfulness of Mordecai. Thank you for the obedience of Esther. But most of all, Lord, thank you so much for 
your strength, your power, and your faithfulness to your people. We worship you, Lord Jesus, in your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen.